Okay, we have the thumbs up. So we are group number one, and uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot of what the Extension Master Gardener National Code members and a few of our friends who had lunch with us this afternoon um, came away from this meeting with. So um, just to give a little bit of a, of a heads up about the Master Gardener National Committee members, I would invite you as state and local coordinators to feel free to contact any of the members in your region or not in your region. If you have any questions or ideas or resources that you would like to share, feel free to uh, get in touch with Vanessa in Rhode Island, John in Virginia, myself in Tennessee, Susan in Iowa, Chris in Wyoming, um, Missy in California, or any of our at-large members, including Sherry, Terry, Mike, Pam, Nancy. Yeah, 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 and John Ork. So, um, so we are here to support you in all of the various activities that you are doing with your Master Gardener program. And so, in light of kind of that, uh, that team and that emphasis and that mission of support state and local are intended that uh, visited over some brats and uh, cabbage or processes um all big <laughs> ideas for I forgot that this was being taped um, our big idea uh, number one as uh, as we um, sat through this conference and uh, listened to all the great programs that were shared, um, we listened about evaluation and about the ideas that we have to try to move forward in the way that we report not only the outputs but also the outcomes from our program. We really think that we are at an exciting point nationwide um, to take a, a big step forward from the great present to an even better future. So we are we are excited about the opportunities that exist for us nationwide as we look to the next few years. So big idea number one, we are at an exciting point. Big idea number two is uh, there are a lot of excellent materials, planning and evaluation efforts that are going on in states um, across the country. And we got them from great graphics to uh, and many of them, I mean, even those of us who, you know, trying to keep up with things on a national scale, many of those efforts were new. So it's exciting to hear about those because many of us didn't even know that they existed. I'm doing all the talking, guys. We want to do a great job. Um, <laughs> number three. We are excited. So this is our big idea number three, um, a.k.a. our aha uh, moment that is sort of a little bit of an action step. We think that it is time for a national strategic planning effort that both um, brings together uh, a lot of the goals that we know we share and provides something for um, states, whether you already have a plan in place or whether <laughs> you're like me and you hope that in five years you do, um, something to, um, to latch on to. So as we stand right here, for those of you who are still in this room, what do you think? Do you agree with our big idea, AKA AHA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, um, it's, it's highly uh, possible that when we get to the point where we're taking input from our volunteers, strategic uh, euphemism for the term strategic planning so that we don't have to say it over and over, but, um, but this is, do what? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. one of the reasons we kind of have strategic plan is because if you go to the USDA or any of the big stakeholders, we would get money or something. Mm -hmm. So we do have to stick with that, but internally. Yes, but as far as gathering input um, over the uh, over the next few years, we'll we'll try to pre to present that in as personalized and as a people appropriate uh, way as we can. So our action items for the next uh, next few months uh, up to a year is to evaluate our budget and where we stand in terms of the resources that are available for the National Committee because one of the first things that we really want to get accomplished over the next few months is 
the, the platform for some of our digital efforts that we want to and prepare ourselves uh, to move forward with a more cohesive uh, web presence for for us, you know, for those of us in this room and uh, peers and colleagues who aren't represented physically right here. And we want to plan an in-person meeting for the next six months. So that the next time we get together, all of us, um, we have planning and some to um, lay a foundation and we can ask you for even better questions and input as we plan for the future. Anything else? All right, we're done in under 10 minutes. Wonderful. <laughs> Proud. Nearly new who learned the art of the background change. Woohoo! So, again, if you guys can aim for this mic when you're speaking for we can capture. Otherwise, how about it? Yeah. I guess so. Well, okay. Everybody, we are nearly new. Some more new than others. Um, so first we're going to introduce all of ourselves. So our group members, first of all, do you want to give a story of this? Sure. Uh, I'm Megan Pleasanton from Delaware State University. And uh, my horse was just a, the grand champion Appaloosa horse at our Delaware State Fair. So that's <laughs> And his name is Adonis, which his I think is, is fabulous. Yeah. So we also have um, Sarah Shields here from Louisiana as the state coordinator, um, the home of Bluebell Ice Cream. We can all be thankful for that. Um, Jeff Wilson, um, Mississippi State Coordinator, um, and that's the he's from the home of Helen Keller. Um, Brett yeah. Palmerson from Vermont, you're the state coordinator, and her house is net zero which is really cool, doesn't use any fossil fuels at all. Um, and then I'm Becca Legrani, I am um, from New York, I'm a county coordinator and I play the bassoon, which most people don't know what that is. That's what it is. <laughs> um, okay, so for the three things that we learned, a big one that um, kind of made me go aha, and I think my team members kind of felt similarly is that this conference reminded us that extension is really awesome. Um, there's so much getting done and there's so much potential for improvement. Um, and it's really cool that, you know, we're on the ground in our counties, we're on the ground in our states, but we're part of this national network. And kind of just being reminded of that more frequently um, helps you to be motivated in your work, learn from your peers. And so I think it's really important for that then to be communicated to our Master Gardener volunteers that they're also part of this awesome national network. Um, and so if we can teach them that um, in their trainings, remind them that throughout the years, um, maybe share what other groups are doing, um, they can get new ideas and feel really motivated and inspired. So let's not um, let extension be the best kept secret anymore. All right, All right so next we decided um, on program evaluation. And how can we improve the evaluation processes? And we're talking about all of the processes from the um, initial individual trainings to the initial training as a whole, um, to training our interns at the end of their first year of you know, volunteerism when, once they become officially certified, and then evaluating our current master gardeners on an annual basis so we can um, know at each stage of the process where we can improve. And then, of course, diversity. Uh, we learned a lot about that and how to attract younger audiences by um, including transportation, maybe changing the location or the time and uh, day of our training. Um, maybe offer an online course or something that people can take and, and use at their own home. Um, and even include evenings and weekends to help strengthen our Master Gardener program through diversity. Okay, so actually, um, it's to make it more engaging. Um, I'm just going to speak from my personal position. I train with two other counties. This is my first year training. Um, and the other folks are very much set in their ways of lectures. Um, and I come from an adult education background, and so I really want to change that. And Molly's um, talk this morning really inspired me to 
kind of push my views um, and try to change things and shake them up a little bit. And so I'm really going to try to incorporate some of the techniques she used this morning into our training this fall, um, even though it's less than a month away. Uh, <laughs> so I would love to incorporate more hands-on activities, kind of like the flipped classroom model. Um, brain, um, brain breaks like that we did this morning. One idea I had while we were doing like the one, two, three activity, it made me think of the same way our, uh, our brains work when we do bop it. And even like having a bop it for during breaks at the training, you know, they can get coffee, they can chat, they can like literally play. I think that's a really like just new ideas like that. Um, and so I'm excited to um, build that in. And then also educating them about adult learning because they're then going to go on and teach adults. Um, and so modeling different techniques um, and teaching them a little bit of the theory in a fun way, um, I think is really important and kind of gets them thinking about what they're doing in a new way. So we're playing musical microphone here. But, um, so on evaluations, I mean, extension, we do a really good job of evaluating a moment in time. And so we're going to, we're working on, and many of your states also are um, more, an evaluation more over a period of time to find out if there's a behavioral change or if there's an adoption of a practice, um, you know, less pesticide usage or whatever. So to evaluate one year out, two year out, three years out, and to see if there is a behavioral change or an adoption of a practice. In addition to the first two action items that were mentioned on the slide, Jeff and I were also discussing making changes to promotional videos and our educational materials that we either use for promotion or in the class. Just having that uh, broader audience in mind without kind of being deceptive or just letting people know exactly who it is that they're going to be working with and kind of can expect to work with. So that's, I think, probably my number one to-do list whenever I get home. Um, so I'm a state coordinator and I'm the only person in the whole state. And a lot of these things don't necessarily apply to me because I just do one training for everybody across the state. So I was thinking more about um, people have asked a lot for advanced training, and I really like the idea. I can't remember the gal who was doing the self-directed. Oh, that's a great idea to have like a framework for people who want to study on their own and move forward with their training, but also it can be done independently. So a little bit more realistic when you're working with people across the whole state. And that's all we had. And what we can always do is you get a clip for the next slide, the next group come up. And that would be Minnesota. Do, do I need to reset it? Yes. <laughs> My team's not gonna come up. That's fine, guys. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is my team. Um, so um, more of us were here yesterday, but had to drive back. Hopefully they missed this storm because that's gross out there. Um, but we have Tim Kenny, the director, and then Jackie Froming and myself, Christy Marsden, who are extension educators with the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. This is us. They look so happy. Okay, so three things we learned. I know this is bad practice, small words, blah, 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 and I'm just going to read them to you, but this is fine. It's the last day. All right, so the first thing we learned is that it's not about content or knowledge, what we do with Master Gardeners, but it's also about what we do that relates to our audiences. So collectively, we need to build models and tools to help Master Gardeners authentically and respectfully engage with their audiences. Uh, the second thing we learned um, is that adult, well, um, adult learners bring their previous knowledge to the and impacts their abilities to continue learning. That was more of my learning. It's something where you maybe know it, but as a millennial, I sometimes dismiss it. So I, maybe I shouldn't do that. And then um, we also learned that there's a controversy about learning styles. We have not agreed that there are no learning styles, but we learned that there's, we learned that there's controversies about it and there's places to learn more yeah, okay. And then 
we're always learning. So um, our action items are is to develop engagement and assessment tools for master gardeners that are on site, friendly and quick in order to learn the needs of the audience. Um, for example, potentially creating something to determine what vegetable food cell shelf customers would want to consume. And so Jackie came up with the ideas is at, at the food shelf you had like, um, like uh, vases with beans and they had all the and they could quickly put it in and then at the end of the time you could see what the differences are. It's like we need to know what they want in order to help them. It's kind of not great to just be, oh, well, this is what you want and you want it, right? And so thinking of a different way of helping our master gardeners engage with our audiences. If we want them to do it, we have to help them do it by creating tools and models. Uh, the second one was being more intentional about capturing visual diversity within the program. And so for our team is to increase awareness for including diverse audiences in promotional materials so that everybody can see themselves as a part of the Minnesota Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And then lastly is better acknowledge the prior knowledge of new Master Gardeners within the core course modules, which is our um, training for the um, base of being a Master Gardener. There we go. What do you mean? I mean, if you just did it in the last, that'd be pretty funny. Do you think it's gonna, yeah, are we good? Okay, so I'm Pammy Monette. I'm part of the Oregon State University crew. Back there, we have mostly county coordinators. We have Victoria, Cigna is actually the online, our online Master Gardener coordinator. And we have Elizabeth Records, Michelle Sager, Rachel Suits, and Brooke Edmonds. Okay, so we kind of talked a little bit about what we learned and a big one for me, I think that seems simple enough, but that we just don't do a lot in practice is having the person or the audience that you want to pull in, just create the program. That was kind of a big aha moment for me. And so creating it with folks instead of for them. And so that's going to be a lot that we'll kind of try and work into more so of maybe our um, program programming for the public. And um, so our public workshops and classes. Um, another thing that we really liked is that, um, I think it was, was it North Carolina? You guys said that, had that idea of having that prerequisite of a master gardener or of a, just a gardening 101 course before folks commit to the actual master gardener program. So that was something that we learned. I don't know if it's going to be one of our action items, but we definitely like the idea of using, say, Seed to Supper, which a lot of our organ programs use as that Gardening 101 prereq for six weeks, then have people commit and then kind of go from there with the rest of the Master Gardener class. Um, and then we, this will kind of tie into some of our action items, but we just learned that we can really work to expand our training calendar throughout the whole year. So we tend to train January through March. It's kind of how it's always been. We have the three hour blocks. And so we want to work all of this into our, the whole year of training. Um, the other thing that we were kind of chatting about was to kind of learn techniques and tools of how to communicate to new master gardeners, what we expect the culture and acceptance and uh, respect to be like within our within our training. Um, so kind of taking that meaningful shift and a lot of these tools that we've learned and kind of implementing that and recognizing that as a priority at the very beginning instead of just kind of glossing over it and reminding people when they, you know, like say something that's disrespectful or that can be um, offensive to folks. So our action items, we came up with this big 2020 revisioning program um, that our administrators will hopefully love and throw lots of money at us. But we, um, and we actually have some money that's, uh, we have the College of Ag in Oregon State kind of rolled out these $10,000 innovation grants that are not due until the 30th of September. So if we can get a proposal together, our big action item is to hire a uh, instructional design uh, facilitator um, designer that is specifically for extension programming to help us as statewide master gardener coordinators 
kind of work towards all of this revisioning and create a template or a, uh, what did we call it? What do you guys call it? A framework. So not a curriculum because we have the curriculum. We have really great online curriculum, really great in-person curriculum. We need more of a, not, I don't want to say top down, but our county programs are kind of doing all sorts of different things. And we kind of want that structure, that framework that includes all of the stuff that we've been talking about that's going to be more effective for adult learners. So it was kind of going to be in a retreat format, possibly. So we all go to the coast, you know, for a few days, have this designer come with us. We can kind of input all of this stuff in a very um, intentional way and then pull out, you know, these best practices, maybe some ideas of, about like flipped classroom, hybrid learning, kind of what our tools are, and then really come away at the end of the two days with a, all right, this is what we're going to implement in Oregon and have that as our new framework. Um, and so I'm not sure who's going to be on the, uh, uh, the docket to apply for this innovation grant, but hopefully we'll get that in. I think it's a possibility and we'll let you guys know how it all works out for us. Uh, I think that's it. All right. Thanks. So I'm just going to say I'm feeling a little bit jealous that some of the uh, more University of Maryland Extension Master Gardener coordinators aren't here. So I'm looking right into that recording and they can all know that what's going to happen when we come back. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, it's been really great. Um, our group is uh, some of the many urban extension uh, master gardener coordinators. So I'm Erin Melantine. I'm from the University of Maryland. Yvonne Cooper, University of Arizona. John Zentek, Rutgers Crawford Extension. Amy Vu, University of Florida. Deirdre Hulk, MSU Extension, Michigan State. We had lunch today, so we've had many, many hours of talking so far. Uh, we've all gotten to know, to know each other fairly well. Um, here we are enjoying lunch at the terrace. Um, when discussing our big three, we found that a lot of them correlated pretty directly to some action items that we're hoping to observe in our own programs. Um, so forgive me, as others have said, for reading from the slide. We know this is bad form. Um, but training master gardeners and other participants using non-traditional mechanisms is beneficial and includes hybrid learning, flipped classrooms, web-based and lab-based work. So some of the action items that we kind of, um, that kind of precipitated off of this included developing a congruent class for professional and personal development using some of those mechanisms um, and developing a plan of how to incorporate and implement flipped classrooms um, and then make it happen because these are supposed to be goals for six to 12 months and I don't think I'm gonna get a flipped classroom done in six to 12 months. Uh, the big uh, takeaway number two was language, language, language. We all have ways to come to make our words inclusive and relevant. Not everyone has a yard, but everyone has a bias. You can use that. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> Um, so our action item from this, of course, is to increase the inclusivity and diversity of promotional and training materials that our programs are using. We want our program to reflect how our cities and urban centers look, right? So we need to make sure that our promotional and training materials are making that clear. And big three of three, uh, when developing programming for adult learners, it's important that we incorporate a variety of activities, breaks, and mingling time. Um, so the action item, pretty straightforward, incorporation of adult education um, techniques in our programming. And so we learned a lot of those from this morning. Any other thoughts? That sounds great. Great. And well, of course, we wanted some eye candy. So here's some pictures from our programs. We have a photo from Rutgers. Uh, this is one of our community gardens in Baltimore City. It's called Our Community Garden. Um, this is the, the Wick Garden in Detroit. We have a photo from Arizona's uh, Phoenix's training class. And then um, 
an awesome farm to table camp in Orlando. So. Oh. <laughs> didn't update that slide, so maybe you guys are in here. I broke it. Just ignored your slides. Well, maybe that's the case, but I'm, so I'm going to go in order. So group eight, goal-oriented. I'll start and then somebody who wants to go next on the next page. Okay, so we split into kind of some subgroups based on commonalities in what um, our goals were for each of us. We kind of went around the group and all talked about what our individual goals were for our programs and then matched up based on what um, we had in common with the others. So. So these are our members, and everyone you can see up here, we were a large group. So things that we learned that we all incorporated into our programs that kind of hit those uh, light bulb moments for us individually. Um, better programming around inclusiveness, realigning our priorities, really making sure that what our volunteers are doing relate to the priorities of the program and the goals of the program. I know a few of us have some stagnant volunteer opportunities that we've always done, in my case, for 26 years in a row. And that's a great relationship, but does it serve the education purposes? Does it serve, if we didn't have that, would that make more time for these other goals that we really want to make? So um, realigning those priorities and the volunteer opportunities. Uh, we also learned revamping the training um, to better accommodate everything else that we've learned here, and, and this might be the push. I know I've been saying that for at least three years, um, but this might be the good push that moves us along into some of those new techniques. Um, USDA compliance came up in a couple of the subgroups. Do they have what they need? From the talk we learned some don't, some do. Where do they find that information? Um, and then implementing the programs in underserved areas. So for inclusiveness, we're gonna, um, you know, each of us have such a different situation from our program. Some are state coordinators, some are the only person in the state doing any of this, some are, you know, I'm a county coordinator. And so we kind of did a little more broad action items. So then we can further break down these action items into what, what's the step that we're going to take or initiate the steps next. So attracting more individuals in rural communities and those not already attracted to horticulture for inclusiveness. Um, streamlining, like I was talking about, those volunteer opportunities and editing out some, revamping the training, working on with some of the other groups that we've heard that are already doing the flipped classrooms or some of the digital models to try and get more hands-on activities happening instead of just lectures. And then the USDA compliance was a little more um, straightforward in what steps to take to make sure compliance is happening. 
the registration sheets, justice for all posters, and the civil rights statements. Yeah, um, since you guys did this one, why don't, why don't you okay. add to that? I can work on this one really quick. I know um, something we talked about a lot was actually forecasting or figuring out. Sorry, figuring out what our what is the impact that we're going for in our different communities. I mean, um, coming from Vegas, I've got master gardeners in one area, but we've got a whole other big old county with um, little tiny um, communities that you know we just we're just not getting in there. Um, so what is it that we want? And um, Kim was really helpful in helping me um, figure some of this stuff out. So um, anyway, you know, figure out what it is that we want, selecting the audience, selecting what area that we're trying to get into, and that extension gardener certificate program. What a wonderful idea. Right in there, you start with gardening 101 and try and get people from that community into those gardens. We've got community gardens there but they're disrepair, nobody takes care of them unless a master gardener might wander over there and water for them, maybe for a couple months and then don't, because they don't live there. So that was a big thing is teaching where they live, you know, go to where they live. So identify some actual volunteers from that certificate program that live in that area. Um, then maybe, hopefully, that would be our next thing is holding a um, master gardener training in that area. Uh, um, getting uh, barriers and uh, you know so they can access the same program and then hopefully aiming for this outcome master gardeners um, volunteer in their own neighborhoods they have ownership they help that community have ownership of that space so anyway I was very excited so Claire, thanks everybody yes, yes. You have the opportunity to offer the um, certificate program for free in those oh yeah yeah um but the you know the idea is to make it where people will come but not necessarily do it for them but give them the tools to um take ownership of that program so i think that was it uh, it's a the, button it's a, <laughs> oh, oh. you're up next How do I want to? Uh, the for Thank you. As long as I don't touch the mouse, it should be fine. Alrighty, so we are the, the host group, Wisconsin. Thank you very much for coming and thank you, Mike, for hosting and Amy and Susan. The rest of us on the team, um, I am Amy Nozel. I'm in the Northern end. Um, I'll have each of us introduce ourselves. Loud and proud. I'm Mary Langer from Oneida County. Kimberly Miller from Winnebago County. And we from Waukesha County. Lisa Johnson from Dane County. So we got pretty good coverage for the state, I think. When we think about our questions of what we learned, um, and we got to do a little bit of language, a lot of it was like, well, we need this, we need this, we need this. And actually, you know, thinking forwardly, well, we see opportunities, for instance, to focus on addressing and expanding our program's access and um, our diversity. Uh, we do need to find a way to keep empowering volunteers to, to be the community educators we ultimately want them to be. Uh, with the direct communication specifically, and again, with, with outreach and creating that open, inclusive environment. Um, we also are big ahas, you know, realizing that it's okay to do things differently and that it's okay to challenge each other. Like, are we doing that again? What's the so what there? What's going on? That we can, um, as colleagues, support each other with some of that um, brainstorming and reinvention. So our most boring slide, but quickly, when we talk about we see opportunities to focus on addressing and expanding our programs, access and diversity, that's something that oh, we can come together as a state to have that conversation and to maybe start with level one online training. What's well, what's in, eh, what definitely can we improve? Um, we talked about, um, again, a lot of, you know, props to Minnesota. It's really quite impressive to watch what you're doing. And so things like when you're creating 
support packets for, again, these volunteers to go out and be community leaders, to be community educators. Maybe that's something that we can add to our internal toolkit. And um, when we talk about you know, doing things differently, again, uh, there's a lot of safe space that you need to establish and the trust that we have among colleagues. And so we do have monthly webinars to connect and, and share ideas. And maybe there's a few other ways that we can, again, encourage, you know, it's kind of like, oh, it's, it's Mike's webinar. You know, and I, what, what else can we do so that more people are talking? I like your ideas. Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I guess in some what we, you know, very impressive to be meeting with everyone around the, yeah, yeah. So thank you for um, sharing your stories with us and it just keeps us doing our good work as we get into our new uh, reinstated home with Bucky here. Ooh, yeah. That slide is hanging on my wall. Thank you guys. Thank you. I got all that on that yesterday. Try to stop saying that. Group six, ye old Western states. Uh, I put them right down the corner and again, same for the mic. Oh, they're throwing me to the wolf. Okay. Well. We are the Western State Group. Um, my name is Dara Palmer. I'm a state coordinator from Montana. I'm going to make you guys introduce yourself. I'm Cassie Anderson. I'm a county coordinator in Colorado. I'm Hannah Johnson. I'm the county coordinator in Wyoming. I'm Carol Romero. I'm one of the two coordinators in Boulder County, Colorado. I'm Amanda Tanan, the other one, but two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Donna Hoffman. I'm the county coordinator in Medtronic County in Wyoming. Awesome. So uh, the big three takeaways that we had were um, we uh, thought it was important not to guess, and that's speaking of the demographics, so that was a huge one. Yeah, and they're going to do little dance and animation to keep you guys awake, so. <laughs> <laughs> the forward and backward casting um, was a huge... <laughs> okay, I can't watch. <laughs> to be able to plan for things, for goals that you want to do is really important, especially for me as a state coordinator, um, so that, you know, uh, I don't have to like this is what I want to do this is my goal but I don't know how to get there that's been a huge problem so that was actually very helpful and then uh, methods of impact data collection were another <laughs> takeaway we had yes uh, so uh, Donna had a great idea about holding did you want to talk about that holding novice master gardener class I'm just in the process of setting up my upcoming training but I really like the idea of, of doing that we've had the conversation in the state of, of whether we're teaching people to be better gardeners or teaching people to help people become better gardeners. And there's a lot of people that take the class to become better gardeners. Right. So um, I, I, I'm going to figure out a way to do that. Right. And phase it in this year. X was establishing a family gardening course. And I don't remember whose idea that was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are working on different food security projects and we've also been, it's been suggested that we uh, increase our income uh, potential. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. So we were thinking maybe we could establish a class, a family gardening class, and, and have one of the components in it be donation so that we can you know, teach people how to do the grow a row and, and how easy it is and how simple it is to donate things to food banks. So we would be working on that problem from both directions. We have the more well-to-do families who are able to participate in this and pay to learn and then able to grow. And then we have the people who utilize the food banks and they would be getting what they need. And um, Maine had a really interesting model of, I, I know it's not right, but I think of it as the Costco model, where they have someone who is in the food bank showing people how to prepare kale. You know, this is a, just quick little demonstrations. And so we're thinking really an exciting way, and another thing to add to this food bank proposal. So, and then Cassie, do you want to? Um, so in Adams County, we were struggling really to reach 
the entirety of the county. And I talked to one of our fellow county coordinators who actually used Nextdoor to advertise to the entire county. And as for our spring garden series, we have four classes in the spring that we give to the public. And last year in 2017, we had maybe 15 to 25 people in each class. This year we had 120. So it really was kind of remarkable for increasing how many people knew that we were giving classes and programming and awareness of our program in general. So it was a really good way to do that. All right, so our action items for data collecting were to incorporate a signature link for a survey. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that um, <clears throat> if someone was interested in taking the survey, it wasn't forced upon them, but it was an option. So something very simple that we could implement. Also, um, I believe one of you already has in place the, the postcard. Do you want to chat about that? Yeah, so whenever a client comes into the office, they have to fill out just a little bit of their information. We usually explain it's for reporting purposes, but also so if we look at their question again and have more, more suggestions or more offers, then we can get back in touch with them. And so they fill out the basic demographics and we can use it in our reporting as well. It's really very useful. Um, Carol, why don't you do the... So this came out of some other suggestions that were made. I can't remember which session it was, but um, I really like the idea of helping us get the uh, uh, impact, the so what data um, from uh, by asking the volunteers that are working in the projects that are outside of our office, like our jail garden, um, uh, to get us the demographics true, but also the quotes that matter and um, photographs of them in action. And I, that was something that was, it's, it's so simple and yet so elegant. It's rather than us running around trying to catch them in the act, they can <clears throat> get, send it in to us. There's, there's water there if you need it. <laughs> All right, and then lastly, uh, including diversity training in a master gardener orientation so that they feel more comfortable asking for these demographic, uh, the data that we're looking for. So educational delivery uh, was a big one, as I mentioned before, and it sounds like that's kind of a theme um, with people. I've heard things about flipped classrooms and doing some online digital things and trying to get away from the death by PowerPoint. So that's definitely something I'll be thinking about in my state because that's pretty much all we have is a PowerPoint lecture, if you will. And so even if my county educators don't adopt those other methods, at least it's available to them so that they have a wide range of ways to educate their people. Because as you know, Montana is huge, so there's a diverse population and some things may not work for other counties. So it's good to hear what, what you all are doing and what's working well so that I can take that home and hopefully do some changes. So. Well, again, we, <laughs> okay. <laughs> again, um, uh, another thing that we talked about was the master gardeners um, don't feel confident in their training, specifically with diagnostics. Uh, we talked about that, I believe it was on Tuesday, that the more um, education they have, the more confident they're going to be. So that was a good um, lesson to know, just that we need to train them better in diagnostics so that they can go out and um, help other newer master gardeners and also the public. And then a great point um, one of the team brought up was that opening Master Gardener yards to train so that people can have some hands-on um, practice and who's better yard than a Master Gardener. So it's like the cobbler with the shoes, right? Your yard's always the worst, at least mine is. <laughs> Lots of stuff to see in there. So um, that also goes along with real world um, product practice, just going down to your big box store seeing what's out there, you know, talking about how you apply pesticides or, you know, what's available to people and what's the best practice in that specific case. And then again, um, digital content, I did touch on that, just developing and producing effective digital content that'll work for a variety of demographics. So I think that was it. 